so a very warm welcome and good evening all of you uh, we'll be in this 39th edition of thursday musings uh, everyone has been muted the panelists can unmute themselves when they want to speak so i welcome you all uh, next slide and since dr tufan pati sir doesn't want to me to introduce him as we already know him too much sir over to you saving one minute okay thank you alin so next slide pavan please with me we have two brilliant moderators and two brilliant companions dr amrit patodoshi from bhubneshwar is the professor of psychiatry in high tech medical college where we work together and he is a consultant psychiatrist in amri hospital milling trust clinic the direct council member of ips and he is the editor of odisha journal of psychiatry he is quite vibrant quite active you will see it and we have got with us dr alim siddiqui from lucknow he is the director of healthy mind neuropsychiatry and behavioral sciences at lucknow visiting professor of psychiatry eras lucknow medical college and hospital his past direct council member of ips just passed he is a guest faculty in amity university and he is the finance secretary of ima lucknow as well as iapp up uk chapter and we have got very eminent chair persons with us next slide please dr thapa dr thapa my dear friend old friend good friend who may have bothered a lot and uh, he is a eminent neuropsychiatrist and addiction specialist he was professor and hod of department of psychiatry government medical college Jack, jammu and he is ex medical superintendent of government psychiatric hospital jammu he had been the president of ips jammu chapter and organized two national conferences at jammu that is aiapa and jerican and he is election commissioner of north zone ips he is the founder president of iapp of J and jammu ka <laughs> jnk branch welcome dr thapa and with us we have got naresh naresh padlamani he is from hyderabad he has presented research papers for bhagwati award and sips 99 and young researcher award category and he had attended in ap at philadelphia his areas of interest include suicide prevention mhc critical appraisal of research articles represented south zone as wicket keeper and lifted the national ippl cup twice 2007 and 2018 and organized and conducted suicide prevention awareness 2000 run hyderabad for the first 5 years other roles national executive committee member representing south zone is ex honorary general sir journal secretary of ips south zone branch ex president hyderabad psychiatric society ex general secretary ips and the pradesh combined state ex chairperson of school mental health program ex associate professor of haskal medical college telangana now associate professor of apple institute of medical science hyderabad now chief consultant psychiatrist in columbus hospital welcome naresh and before i hand over the meeting to the to eminent chair persons i will request dr shohini whose presence have inspired us a lot and dr shohini please give your valuable enlightening inputs and then the meeting will belong to the chair person for chair persons welcome shohini madam kind invitation and uh, i would like to say i am very happy that uh, the eminent uh, group has included neuropsychology neuropsychological assessment rehabilitation interpretation as a valuable uh, discipline in the management of mental disorders i think it's apt that thursday musings especially dr alam should think of neuropsychology as a, a important discipline and i am extremely happy dr keshav kumar is talking on the subject dr keshav kumar has done eminent work in the field of neuropsychiatry i would say understanding of uh, mental disorders from the perspective of brain dysfunction especially his contribution has been in terms of not just lobe functions but in terms of network analysis of brain dysfunction and based on this aspect of network analysis which he has brought in as his own uh, input into the field of neuropsychology in the country he has also developed very uh, innovative 
remediation programs, not just for neurological disorders, but for uh, psychiatric disorders, disorders such as OCD. And with this uh, in NIMHANS, we have had very good experience of treating patients with uh, psychiatric disorders using neuropsychological techniques. I am happy that Dr. Keshe Kumar is sharing his uh, research findings with all of you. And uh, with these words, I would like to wish the gathering a, a happy evening, a very fruitful interaction, and a, a good sharing of knowledge. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now Thank over you. to the chairperson, please. Dr. Thapa and Dr. Naresh Badraman, please take over. Uh, I request Dr. Thapa has to unmute. Yes, ma'am, please. I request your permission to leave I, because of my yes. eye injury. I don't want to see the screen for a long time. Okay, thank, thank you, you, madam, for your kind okay. presence. Thank, thank you, okay. madam. It is inspiring. Okay. Uh, ma'am has got myself, Amrit, and Dr. Keshav also. So <laughs> thank you so much, ma'am, joining us. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good evening to all. The today topic is neuropsychological evaluation and interpretation by Dr. Keshav Kumar, who is MPhil PhD in neuropsychological neuropsych specialty. He's a professor in neuropsychology, Nimhans, former visiting faculty, New Zealand University, former visiting faculty, and B. R. C. Manesar, founding member of Cognitive Neuroscience Society of India. He is a founding member of Neuropsychological Society of India. He is a member of International Neuropsychological Society. He has developed Nimhan's Neuropsychological Battery of Elderly, NNBE, the first elderly battery in India. He has also developed Digital Cognitive Augmentation Program, DCAP, a cognitive retraining app for normal age related decline as well as dementia. So today we have Dr. Keshiv Kumar. He will tell us detail about the neuropsychological evaluation and interpretation. We want to listen to this person and uh, uh, over to Dr. My colleague, chairperson. Thank you, Dr. Tapa. I mean, I think it's a really a privilege to be the chairperson for this session. And I think both of them are seniors, Dr. Tapa and Dr. Keshav Kumar. And I would thank the East Zone members, uh, Dr. Tufan Pati, Dr. Alim, and Dr. Amrit, for giving me this opportunity to chair this session. Um, I mean, this is a very topic which is very close to my heart as well. And probably I don't agree with the term, you may call it otherwise, that neuropsychological assessment. I don't agree with that term itself. The reason is brain, brain has nerves. That's all. It has, doesn't have anything else. So it is, we are examining what is called the neuronal function. So the difference between neurology and we say psychiatry is that we are in neurology, we are doing what is called as peripheral neuronal function assessment. Right, so that is the sensory reception part and the motor part we are trying to examine in say what is called as neurology. But in psychiatry, what we say is we are doing what is called as central neuronal function assessment. Right, so there's a lot of difference between these two and we need to be very sure what we are doing exactly in uh, what is called as neuropsychological term. But that term is very vague actually. And I mean, just to give you a, a, an example, I and mean, why do we do this? So why do we do a neuropsychological assessment? Right, so even in neurology, we ask this question. Whenever we ask this question, we say that localizing the lesion. So what it means is we are localizing where the lesion is in neurology. That's exactly what we are trying to do in psychiatry as well. So there is no psychiatric assessment. There is no mental status examination. There is no psychiatric examination. There is only what we say as central neuronal function assessment, what we are trying to do, including all the parameters, what we are like consciousness, orientation, memory part, cognitive thought, mood, everything we are trying to do in neuropsychological assessment. And why we are trying to do this is to localize. 
say for example hallucinations are part is there so we have different types of hallucinations say sensory modalities say visual auditory so we are localizing where that is and on part of it so we know that thalamus is a center so which is the receptive center or it's like a we say a general post office of a inner city so which is the headquarters of a post office it receives letters and it distributes so that's exactly what the thalamus is doing that is receiving the sens sensory perception i mean sensory reception part then perception and processing it then sends to other parts of the brain and then final pathway the cortico striatal thalamic cortical pathways so that's the executive function which is doing the motor part after thalamus so now what we are trying to do, say for example we have hallucinations we have just described so when we say say for example reflex hallucinations so what is reflex hallucinations is that say um, i mean same modality so say what we say as uh, um, say we are listening to the fan sound of the fan and we are hearing voices so what it means is there is a mix up there in the uh, sensory system and we are localizing that lesion there say for example we have say uh, i mean for example uh, a functional hallucination so we are trying to again go back to the cortex the so thalamocortical uh, pathways or the network which is involved extra campine so we are going that is the physical component or the physics component so we are going to the thalamo cerebellar pathway which is could be involved so what we are trying to do is we are localizing the lesion that's exactly what we are trying to do in neuropsychological assessments in various parts so this is just an example what we are doing i'm sure dr keshav kumar will expand in various ways and he is much accomplished speaker as well so thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and i will ask dr keshav kumar to start his presentation with this brief introduction yes okay. dr keshav you are welcome you start your presentation thank you thank you sir let me get my slides up just give me a minute i like to thank the chairpersons for uh, the kind introduction uh, i like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to uh, be with stalwart psychiatrist of this country and i'm really privileged to be with you all sir and i'm also privileged to have my teacher dr shobhni uh, who had come for a very brief short while uh, the chairperson has also raised very interesting questions about how localization happens and uh, with the advances in neurosciences and neuroimaging we have moved from localization to uh, seeing brain as a whole as a network so primarily my talk will be on neuropsychological assessment as to how to elicit responses using standardized tests so when we talk about a psychological test i'd like to uh, highlight this a psychological test is a standardized behavioral sample uh, standardized on a particular culture so the test that we use today is primarily from some other country so i'll be talking on neuropsychological assessment and interpretation so neuropsychology neuropsychology is a study of just please give me a minute my toolbar is coming in the way right so neuropsychology is a study of a brain and behavior relationship specific tests are administered to elicit specific responses to infer functional integrity of the brain even with so much of imaging today and the localization has become so easy with brain imaging the, the imaging can never tell about somebody's intelligence or his aptitude so to understand the functional integrity of the brain we need to have standardized tools to elicit certain responses so the root of neuropsychology lies in neurology and psychology and neurologists at that time were also psychiatrists uh, who did a lot of work in both psychology and uh, neurology as well so there's a considerable overlap between behavioral neurology neuropsychiatry neuropsychology and neuroscience in general so behavioral neurology people had this assumption of uh, assumption that brain is hardwired and damaged to certain regions of the brain produces certain deficits but the psychiatry focused more on the psychiatric aspects of neurological uh, psychiatric manifestation of neurological disorder neuropsychology looked at neuropsychological test to infer how the brain works in relation to healthy normals as well so neuroscience is generally the entire cognitive neuroscience 
using neuroimaging, psychiatry, neurology, and knowledge from all the disciplines and integrate it. So the history of neuropsychology started in 19th century with Carl Wernicke, possibly the father of neuropsychology. His work on aphasia was a major force which fanned the interest and activity in neuropsychology. So he identified a region in the left hemisphere known as Wernicke's area, he named it after himself, which lesion over there caused dysfunction in comprehension and subsequently Broca identified another area in the frontal lobe which uh, uh, showed, he demonstrated that damage to this region caused Broca's aphasia and uh, a disruption of the connecting cord between Broca's area and Wernicke's area, the arcade fasciculus causes conduction aphasia. So this led to localization, modularity of uh, thought process and functions. So in the earlier years of neuropsychology, interpretation was based on a sense of normal performance by the clinician. So it was very subjective and the normalcy was different for different clinicians. So anything below that normal sense of normalcy indicated pathology for that particular clinician. So the another thing was organicity was diagnosed based on some pathognomic, uh, pathognomonic signs on some particular tests. So the clinical assessment was dramatically altered by Binet with the development of Stanford Binet test of intelligence. Stanford Binet test of intelligence was well standardized with normative data, with clear criteria for satisfactory performance as normal performance. So based on the psychometry, there was an amalgamation of neurological assessment of the brain function and psychometry to have standardized tools to elicit responses in the brain. And that was the beginning of neuropsychological assessment. So this led to the development of fixed battery of relatively well normed and standardized tests. Halstead Wrighton uh, battery is one of those fixed battery. They did assessments on 5,000 people and they established what is normal behavior. So any deviation on the negative side was known to be on the lower side and a uh, standard deviation of two on, on the negative side was known to be uh, dysfunction or impairment. At the same time, in Russia, Luria, who was a trained neuropsychologist, trained in neurology, psychoanalysis, psychometry, used more clinical approaches based on clinical studies. So what he did was he, he looked at patients with lesions and saw what they cannot do and what they could do. So based on that, he developed his own theory of the brain function. He emphasized, emphasized on the sensitivity to lesion location, age, gender, handedness, clinical history, and premorbid level of functioning. So the clinical approach of Luria developed in other parts of the world as well. Christensen in 1979, uh, standardized Luria's approach, integrated the psychometric approach into Luria's uh, uh, clinical approach and uh, developed this battery known as Lu uh, Luria's battery, Luria Nebraska battery, sorry. At the same time, Austrian neuropsychologist Walsh pioneered in the process approach. So it's very interesting to look at this amalgamation and the integration of, uh, of disciplines at that time. So United States also started using the process approach known as Boston process approach. So the major difference of this approach from the clinical approach was push for greater standardization while they had this rich data from clinical observation. So diagnosis and rehabilitation of the brain damaged were the goals of referral at the time. The solution to the test may be achieved by different processes and each of these processes may be related to different areas. The manner in which they approach the problem may be very frontal or, you know, it, it could be different approaches resulting in recruitment of different brain regions and the networks. So the testing situation provided an opportunity for careful observation of behavior rather than focusing on right or wrong. So if there's a patient with damage to amygdala and when we test this patient, the patient may actually when doing a block design, he may put the block in his mouth. But the end result, when you look at the normative data, right and wrong, the score is zero or one. But the entire behavioral observation of patient having an oral explore, exploration would be lost. And uh, uh, usually this kind of behavior is seen in Masha Fawa Bignami with bilateral damage to amygdala. The other approach is hypothesis-driven approach. 
So the belief is what you test is what you get. This is largely dependent on the, depends on the knowledge of neuropsychology, neuroanatomy and reliable psychological and neurological experiments to understand the brain functions. So one cannot determine whether a certain function of the brain is impaired unless it's been tested. So most tests are multifactorial. If you look at any simple test, it will have multiple components in it. There will be a perceptual component, there'll be an attentional component, there will be other components. So at the same time, no cognitive domain is unitary in nature. We simply can't demarcate attention from memory, memory from working memory and other reasons. They're all integrated. They kind of build one on top of another. So patient may fee, uh, fail on any of the uh, tests for any of the reasons. There could be anxiety, depression, anxiety and depression. Depression is known to affect cognitive performance, poor motivation. The test that we use may not be culturally appropriate, may not, some of the uh, people from rural areas, illiterates, may not even be able to do mental manipulation like digit span backward, lack of exposure to testing. Test anxiety itself can cause variations in the test. So it, we need to have a standardized test to uh, be able to understand the uh, uh, interference of all these. So the hypothesis-driven testing or, or more flexible approach to neuropsychological assessment exposes the selection of test based on the referral question. So the testing situation should help answer questions such as, what do the test tell us about the brain? How did the patient achieve the final score? How do normal people perform on this test? This is very important. So when we look at normal people, we, it sets a kind of yardstick to see how much is the deviance of this particular patient with a brain damage or a psychiatric patient with schizophrenia to see where does it fall? Where does this performance fall? So this understanding is very, very imperative or essential. And uh, which is why if there are no normative data, it becomes very difficult to establish what is culturally appropriate in terms of brain function on this particular test. So I'll just go into the overview of the test. So I'll be speaking on attention, executive function, visual spatial skills, and memory functions. So starting with attention, attention systems is what they refer to as. Uh, attention is a complex process. Attention and concentration are required for adequate performance on essentially all cognitive functions. If attention is impact, all other functions cannot be commented upon because the, the attention is the door to conscious awareness. Severe attention impairment impacts on, on the tests of other cognitive abilities as well. So the domains of attention that we generally test are selective attention, sustained attention, divided attention. Selective attention is the ability to focus on one stream of the environment in the presence of competing distractors. Sustained attention is to sustain this attention on a task over a period of time, prolonged period of time, could be more than 20 minutes or 20 minutes or so. Divided attention is ability to focus on multiple aspects of stimuli simultaneously. So some of the tests that we use for attention is something like digit span forward, letter cancellation, a number of cancellation tests have been used to uh, assess attention. So include number cancellation, color cancellation, letter cancellation, so various kinds of cancellation, simple cancellations. The other test that's commonly used for attention is continuous performance test, usually presented on the computer, used for research primarily. And research has shown that right frontal patients perform poorly on all these tasks, especially when the target complexity is increased because there'll be a lot more interference and the right orbital frontal cortex is recruited both for interference as well as focusing of attention. Now I'll just uh, briefly go into the theoretical aspect of it without understanding the theory of all these tests and the functions it's really very difficult to parse this component of cognition. So every uh, uh, cognition will have multiple components and theory is something that we lean on to, to be able to kind of parse the uh, cognitive processes. From the attention theory, there are two systems. There's a posterior attention system and there's an anterior attention system. So the posterior attention system includes reticular activating system for arousal. Then we have the, the midbrain, the superior colliculus, which is involved in shifting of attention from one target to another target. And the pulvinar of thalamus is engaged in 
latching on to the target or focusing on the target, while the right parietal lobe is engaged in involved in disengaging the target. So to be able to switch attention from one target to another, we have this superior colliculus, which moves the spotlight from one target to another, where the pulmonar will latch onto the target and the superior, sorry, the parietal lobes will disengage from the target so that the other target can be engaged too. While the anterior attention system includes the anterior cingulate, in addition to the frontal lobe, the frontal lobe mediate attention control in a top-down guidance and regulation of other processes. So basically it's executive function. The executive function, the primary executive function would be attentional switching, focusing on important aspects and interference control based on the individual's internal and external need and towards the goal-directed activity. And the orbital frontal cortex, like, like I've already told you, is involved in more of the focusing of attention. Right hemisphere is dominant in uh, spatial attention. So when we look at test, like as I said, attention is not a unitary concept, uh, but a multidimensional construct interacting with subcomponents. Uh, so we have this anterior attention system and the posterior attention system. And with this in background, this in mind, we look at the test that we do. So if you look at the digit vigilance test or any other cancellation test, this is the test we use in immense. So the subject is required to cancel two numbers from this array of numbers and here the target would be six and nine. So to be able to fix on the target, defocus from the target to search, it will recruit the entire attention system, the anterior and the posterior attention system. So we need to be able to see what is the kind of dysfunction that we see, what are the kind of errors that people make. And this will give us an idea about what system is impaired. Is it the frontal attention system where the goal itself is lost or is it distractors where the inhibition is impaired or uh, is it the perceptual aspect as the dorsal visual screen? This is uh, color trails. This requires the patient to connect the numbers in a sequential fashion, but alternate between colors. So, so one to two, so one will be pink, two will be uh, yellow, three will be pink, four will be yellow. So they have to alternate. Requires just not attention, but also switching of attention to some extent. This is continuous performance test. The subject is required. A subject is presented with series of uh, letters or numbers or sounds, and a target will be identified. Here, the target is an X, and the per person has to respond to X whenever he sees one. The, the complexity of the task can be increased when the subject is asked to respond to X only if it's preceded by L. So the amount of difficulty, the level of difficulty can be increased. And with the level of difficulty, the recruitment of other regions are evident using neuroimaging studies. So the scoring is hit, the number of target correctly responded, omissions, the number of targets not responded to, commission, number of non-targets responded to. Right frontal patients do badly on this test. So this was digit symbol, uh, uh, symbol substitution, which all of us have used. Here, uh, there is a series of numbers, so one to nine, which has a symbol underneath. So the patient has to learn the symbol under each number. And uh, the patient is presented with just the numbers with the uh, empty boxes under. He has to write or draw the corresponding symbol underneath. And the time taken to do this is recorded. So this is commonly used to understand and estimate the mental speed. Speed of processing is a very common test to understand speed of processing. So coming to motor functions, now we see this, this is the motor cortex. So we see, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor. This is area four, this is the primary motor area, the pre-motor area and the supplementary motor area. The primary motor area is involved in coordination and execution of gross and fine motor functions, including finger movements. Damage to area four causes paralysis. Damage to area six, that is the, the pre-motor area, doesn't cause paralysis, but it disrupts the smooth transition of motor activity from one uh, from one mo uh, complex motor activity to another. For example, rapid tapping. The rapidity and the smoothness of tapping is gone. Instead, the tapping will become clumsy. With the damage to supplementary motor area, uh, the initiation and the speed of response itself can be reduced. So all these regions are highly active during learning. So finger tapping test is one test that we use for tapping Luria's other fist and ring test or uh, uh, 
fist and palm edge. All these tests can be used to estimate and understand how this particular uh, system, motor system is working. This motor system includes the pyramidal and extra pyramidal system as well. Coming to executive functioning. The term executive function includes a broad range of supraordinate cognitive ability. It includes a whole lot of uh, subcomponents like judgment, decision making, planning, regulation of behavior, set shifting, set maintenance, interference control, inhibition, working memory. All these are required towards goal directed activity. So these functions are interwoven with subordinate cognitive abilities such as attention, perception, and memory and language. So impairment in the subordinate function, that's the basic attention and perception, can impair higher level functions. Impairment in higher level executive function can impair the subordinate function because the, the person may not even know what to focus his attention at or what to perceive and spend time if there's no plans generated from the uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is the executive functions. So this is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. This is the actual thinking area that is uh, required for analysis and synthesis of information and towards goal-directed activity. So it's involved in spatial and conceptual reasoning. These processes form the basis of what is referred to as executive function. They include social behavior, reasoning, planning, working memory, thought and concept formation, attention, inhibition, abstraction, and anticipation. So when you look at neuroanatomy, the information from the posterior regions, that's the parietal, occipital, and temporal lobes are sent to the front lobe for action, and the front lobe develops an action plan. So it's these regions, 9 and 46, that are important for actual manipulation of information towards a goal-directed activity. And the information that's manipulated is sent down to area 47 and 45 for mnemonics and decision-making. And the information is from there gated to temporal lobes, parietal lobes, and other regions for action. So the executive functioning are working memory, verbal fluency, attentional switching, and uh, tests of planning is what I'll be speaking on and the test used for these. So working memory is a temporary online storage of information while manipulating another bit of information. So working memory transforms information access from a sequential and disjunct disjunctive process where only one event cluster can be heeded to at any given time. This is because of the limited uh, attention capacity where there's an attention bottleneck. So we can process only one bit of information as it's coming in to a conjunctive pattern where several selected clusters can become incorporated into the stream of consciousness. So the small bits of components of information that's coming in is actually incorporated into a larger chunk in a meaningful manner and incorporated into the entire stream of consciousness. For example, just reading a book, sentence one could be uh, incorporated into the whole gamut of information that you have about from the previous paragraph. So it's just, this is also known as cognitive updating. Just another word for it that's been used recently. So the test for working memory, this is one of the best tests used. This is letter number sequencing from uh, WMS3 and 4 and ways as well. So here, subject is presented with letters and numbers. So for example, if it be 6P, this, the job of the subject is to put numbers first and the letters next. Numbers in ascending order, letters in alphabetical order. So if it's if I take the last example, if it's W, 8, H, 5, F, 3, the numbers are put first and in an ascending order, it will be 3, 5, 8, and, uh, if it's, and the letters are in alphabetical order. So there's a lot of manipulation required in the mind while holding the entire uh, template that is presented to the patient. So that is verbal working memory. This is visual spatial working memory. Uh, predominantly more on the right side. And there are other regions also involved in this. So uh, Corsi block test was the first one that came on this format and the spatial span from the WMS. Here, just like the digit span forward, spatial span forward, there are predetermined numbers, sequences, and there's a board with the uh, uh, cubes on it with numbers printed on it. Only the examiner can see the numbers. The uh, subject cannot see the numbers. So the examiner will tap the cubes in a pre-formulated uh, uh, pre manner. And uh, the subject has to imitate the tapping of the 
of the examiner. So the predetermined manner is something that the patient has to hold and tap. In a backward condition, the just like digits span backward, the experiment or the examiner will tap in a particular sequence and the patient has to give it in the backward order. So there's a lot more manipulation in the backward order. Therefore, it's a very good test for visual spatial working memory. So there are a number of other tests for uh, working memory like NBAC test. So it could be uh, NBAC1, NBAC2, NBAC3. Uh, this is actually when the series of letters, numbers, or anything is presented, the subject is asked to uh, re repeat the previous number as compared to the uh, current number. So if the number is 858, the subject has to re remember the just the previous number and reply, that's NBAC1. In NBAC2, the uh, target will be two numbers before the current number or the target. And in that case, three numbers before the target. Delayed response learning is, uh, there's a, quite a bit of mental manipulation. So if uh, a typical example would be, if a pole is five meter long, another pole is eight meters long. If you take first half of the uh, first pole and the second half of the second pole, what will be the length of the new pole? So one has to hold information online while computing the second bit of the problem. So this is all working, various kinds of working memory. PASAT is another very good test developed by Gronwell and uh, Wrightson. So here the numbers are presented in a sequential order, auditorily, and uh, the patient has to remember the previous number and add to the current number. And after uh, he has done this, when the patient, when the examiner presents the next number, he has to remember only the previous number and add it to the current number, not carry the total forward. So this is an extremely sensitive test for head injury and uh, uh, other conditions. And uh, it's also been used as a cognitive task for remediation these days. So this is the neural network involved in uh, uh, working memory. So uh, the left side is verbal working memory, all the rehearsals. So if you look at the, the drawing here, you can see the green region in the posterior parietal lobes. So this is the region where information is stored temporarily. For example, if I give eight, nine, seven, eight as a number, the number itself is held in the short-term store in the inferior parietal lobes. But if I give the same number and ask the patient to give me backwards, then the patient will hold this number in the short-term store, that's the parietal lobes. He'll rehearse the number subvocally. If it's 8598, he will subvocally re rehearse this number. And this rehearsal will keep the information in the short-term store alive. And this is the reverberatory circuitry. And uh, the information is held in the electrical activity in the reverberatory circuitry while the patient uses the frontal lobes to manipulate the numbers in the reverse order and give it to them. So the motor, I mean, the brain regions that are involved in rehearsal is nine, I mean, 44 and uh, six, that is the motor cortex, the orange region. The storage of information is posterior parietal lobe, this is somewhere here. And uh, the executive function is these two small regions here, 9 and 46, Rodman's classification. Uh, these are the real manipulators of information. But in terms of visual uh, working memory, that's the spatial span, uh, slightly different regions are activated. So uh, uh, rehearsal also includes parietal lobe because the information is presented visually. Storage would include inferior parietal lobe and anterior occipital lobe as well because of the nature of the material. But the manipulation is still 9 and 46. That is the frontal lobes. So this is how cognitive components can be parsed into subcomponents as very essential for rehabilitation uh, and uh, identification of the dysfunction and what really contributes to other cognitive functions. Coming to verbal fluency, so when we look at language, we look at comprehension, we look at expressive speech clinically, we also look at token, we use token test to see if the patient is able to comprehend. The other language tests are typically the verbal fluency test used uh, all over the world. There are two varieties of verbal fluency. There's a phonemic fluency, there's category fluency or semantic fluency for letter or phonemic fluency. So the phonemic fluency requires the subject to generate as many words as possible with a particular letter in 60 seconds. The most common set of letters used uh, in the history of neuropsychology has been FAS. The alternate form could be 
CFL or PRW, which are alternate forms for FAS because there will be a practice effect. So this is something that I don't have a slide on. So, so when a patient is exposed to a test for the first time, when the patient is assessed, even after three months, there is practice effect from the previous assessment. So it's very important to use parallel forms whenever it's available to uh, be able to get a proper picture and not the uh, memory from the previous test. Even parallel forms are known to have practice effect because the person is already exposed to a paradigm of test and the paradigm is repeated even, then the, even though the stimulus is not repeated, the paradigm itself can create a practice effect. So this is something that we need to be careful while we're doing research, especially using pre-post assessments. So category fluency uh, is assessed using animal name test. Again, in 60 seconds, how many uh, animals name can the subject generate? The other variants of the test include vegetables, first names of people, supermarket items, cities. Here, the letter of fluency is more on the frontal uh, load is more on the frontal or frontally mediated because the uh, generation is very nebulous and the uh, patient has to generate a lot more. Uh, uh, the, the test is not very structured in the patient's mind and he has to do a lot of mental search to generate as many words as possible with just one letter as compared to a category. Whereas a category is one category and the patient has to deep dive into one semantic cluster. Uh, therefore, the load uh, is known to be more on the temporal lobes than the frontal lobes. The, uh, the right hemisphere equivalent of this is the design fluency, where the patient has to generate as many designs that are not nameable as quickly as possible, non-scribbling and non-repetitive. So we're looking at novel uh, designs which are not name nameable, and this loads heavily on right frontal lobes. So coming to attention switching, is the ability to switch from one cognitive process or cognitive thought to another cognitive thought. Wisconsin card sorting test is one of the most extensively used tests all over the world. Uh, trail making test part B is also used extensively. The test of sorting or grouping has been uh, used in psychological assessment for concept formation for a long time now. So multiple processes contribute to the performance of these measures. Includes generation and identification of concepts, hypothesis testing, maintenance of attention, resistance of interference, utilization of feedback, because there will be a feedback given by the examiner. When more than one concept is possible, switching from one category and inhibiting a previously relevant category, but not relevant now, amounting to response inhibition is also part of these tests. So these tests, uh, I'm talking about the WCST now, the test, uh, Wisconsin card sorting test consists of four stimulus card placed in front of the subject. Subject is told to match each of this card. In a deck of, it could be 24, 124 uh, cards in a deck, or it could be a shorter version of 64 decks to the uh, key card. The subject is given a feedback each time, whether he or she is right or wrong. The subject must determine the established sorting criteria through a number of trial and error methods. So the sorting criteria could be color, form or number. So this picture represents the actual test. So there are four key cards and there may be a deck next to the patient. The patient is asked to keep the card under one of the key card, one of the four key card. So if uh, the concept that the examiner has is shape, then if the patient keeps the first card under the triangle, the third, card, third key card, then the examiner may say, correct. If the patient uh, uh, keeps the card under the first card, the examiner may say no. So based on the feedback, just yes or no, the subject has to guess what could be the possible category. After the uh, category is established, after 10 trials, the category is changed without warning and the patient has to guess the new category. So there's a whole lot of errors and learning that can happen here. So the first thing is perseveration. It also looks for concept formation and ability to maintain set. So on WCST, there are two, three types of error. People, uh, researchers using WCST need to be aware of this. I'm sure they are aware of this. So one is the failure of maintain, maintaining set occurs when the participant changes the response strategy despite 
the rule being the same. So if the rule is color and the patient has got six, six cards uh, under color, but the seventh card he may just shift to something else. So not maintaining set is one of the errors that you see on WCST. Second one is persuasive error occurs when the participant continues with the same response strategy following a rule switch. This, this is regarding, regarded as a failure to inhibit a prepotent response. So here, when the, when the concept is, for example, color, and after 10 trials, it switches to number, the, the patient continues with color despite of the negative feedback, then this is considered as perseverative error. This is one of the most sensitive error in implicating the frontal lobes. A non-perseverative error is generally considered as random, maybe because of impaired working memory where the patient can't remember what was the concept. WCS is regarded as extra dimensional switch. That is the patient switches from one dimension to another, as opposed to intra-dimensional switch where uh, the patient is asked to switch between one particular dimension that is red color to blue color to yellow color. So within the dimension, the extra dimension switch is considered as a function of dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. This is another very old and interesting test, which actually captures what WCST can capture. So this is trail making test, which has two forms, A and B. The A form is, will have a series of numbers in circles like this. The subject has to connect numbers in a sequential order. The time taken and the errors made is recorded. Whereas number, the part B, which is more of an executive function, the first part is more of a uh, attentional task and scanning task. Part B is an executive functioning task. Here, the subject is requested to uh, connect or alternate numbers and letters in a sequential order. So from number one, he goes to A, and number from A, he goes to two, from num uh, number two, he goes to B, so the, and he has to make this uh, constant switch. So this is a very simple test to still capture the ability to uh, assess the conceptual perseveration. There's another motoric perseveration, more from basal ganglia, but this is conceptual perseveration sensitive for sensitive to frontal lesions. Planning is another important component that we assess all the time. Planning is the ability to look ahead mentally while we are solving a problem. So there are a number of tests that's used for planning. Maze test, Poche's maze. Uh, there's so many other tests like tower test. Tower tests are the most common test used for planning today. And uh, Tower of London, Tower of Hanoi, Tower of Tor uh, or Toronto. I'll just take you through one of these. So this is Tower of London, which has three pegs stuck on a board and you have uh, colored balls with holes and uh, you can put those balls into the pegs. So there's, there's a start position. So this is the start position typically for all the problems and there's a goal position and the uh, test in, uh, goes on in increasing level of difficulty. The first uh, goal is this and from the start goal to move to this one, the subject needs only two moves. So the subject has to move and to the end goal in minimum number of moves. So here it takes only two moves to reach the second problem. While the third problem, the goal position is this, it takes five moves to reach here. And the rule is the subject can move only one ball at a time. This is Tower of Hanoi. Uh, this is based on the, a temple in Hanoi where there, there are 64 uh, discs of this. This is simplified into a test. And this test uh, has uh, discs of different sizes. The rule is a small disc can sit on a, a big disc, but a big disc can't sit on a small disc. Similar to Tower of London, this also has three pegs. The subject has to move the small disc into the one peg, then move the uh, next uh, disc into this. As the small, big disc over here cannot sit on a small disc, so he has to find the mid uh, peg over here. So he has to move to the target peg with a minimal number of moves. And there are five discs on this uh, particular test. And it's extremely demanding. And patients with basal ganglia and motor system have a lot of difficulty on this test. And it's also an extremely good test for planning. Now coming to anterior cingulate cortex. Now this is very important because this region is involved in all executive functions. So after the frontal lobology and exploration of frontal lobes, the focus moved to the anterior cingulate cortex. And you can see there are two bits over here. 
And the blue, blue color is known as the cognitive stream. This is a dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. And you have the ventral anterior cingulate cortex, which is the emotional stream. So the primary function of anterior cingulate cortex on a cognitive stream, of course, it is also a nociceptive cortex and involved in other things like pain pathways. The primary cognitive uh, uh, function of this is response conflict resolution. To be able to resolve uh, 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 conflicts in the mind, for example, if a person is uh, uh, getting rewarded with uh, particular behavior, that is behavior A, and that behavior seems to be useful, he has to shift to behavior B. So he has to inhibit a prepotent behavior B and shift to behavior, sorry, prepotent behavior A and shift to new behavior B. So this conflict is resolved in the anterior cingulate cortex. The other component of anterior cingulate cortex is error monitoring. So response conflict occurs when a task elicits a prepotent inadequate response tendency. So the typical example of this is this troop. So the cognitive stream is more involved in shifting thoughts from one cognitive activity or thought to another cognitive uh, thought or another complex thought. The same thing is done with a subgenual pink region, which is involved in switching from one emotional state or emotional uh, uh, content or thoughts to another emotional content. So emotional flexibility is predominantly, uh, inflexibility is seen when there's a disruption of the subgenual region of uh, cingulate cortex. So this is the typical Stroop test, which has three sets to it. The first sheet of the Stroop test will have, uh, is in black and white and uh, uh, colors are printed in uh, black letters. The patient has to read the uh, uh, words written in black letters. And the second set will have only colored X and the patient has to name the color X. On the third one, the, the words are written in different ink and the words are usually colors themselves. So here the word green is written in blue and the person has to inhibit the ability to uh, inhibit the prepotent tendency to read instead has to name the color. So, the, so this, this has two components to choose between automatic functioning, the prepotent one and shift to a novel uh, kind of responses. So usually there's a conflict between the word and the color and the color is uh, a normal situation here. MRI studies show activation in the anterior cingulate cortex, though literature shows that uh, response, in, uh, sorry, uh, Stroop test is a test for response inhibition. Before one inhibits a prepotent response, that is to stop it, one has to resolve the conflict and the conflict resolution between reading a color and naming uh, the color of the ink is done in the anterior cingulate cortex. So reading alone activates area nine in addition to the speech areas. Coming to the visual spatial functions. Now visual spatial functions are mediated primarily by parietal lobe in association with occipital lobe. Visual information reaching the striated cortex area 17, 18, and information from 19 is sent to the, the dorsal stream of the parietal cortex for visual spatial perceptual aspects. So area seven is important for mediation or perception of movement, distance, spatial location, figure ground relation, depth, three-dimensional property in space. Now, if, there, if there's a lesion here, it'll disrupt all these functions. So when you look at visual spatial functions, we are actually looking for these components of uh, uh, perception. So all the test of visual, visual spatial function is to measure this particular aspect. So the number of tasks that uh, test that we generally use is Bender Gestalt test is to look at the three dimensional component, I mean, two dimensional component of uh, drawing. There's a clock drawing test, which has two components, which will have uh, a executive component and a perceptual component. When the patient is asked to draw uh, a clock with 10 past 10 becomes an executive component. If the patient is has to copy the clock drawn by the examiner become more of a perceptual component. There's also a complex figure copy and the copy can be a visual perceptual aspect while the immediate recall and the delayed recall are more of encoding and memory. Two dimensional, three dimensional tests are very important because many patients can do two dimensional test uh, drawings 
But if there's a disruption of the parietal lobe, it's impossible to draw a three-dimensional uh, cube because the patient may not be in a position to uh, uh, perceive depth and distance and dimensions and angles. Now, this is a two-dimensional test. This is a typical clock test where the patient is not able to copy the drawing, which is indicative of severe parietal involvement. This is block design. Left hemisphere patients uh, perform a little differently from right. Right hemisphere patients distort the picture, but the left hemisphere patients have some uh, semblance to the actual drawing. While doing BGT, the right hemisphere patients disrupt, uh, have disrupted drawing, but the left hemisphere patients have the overall gestalt, but then they also have clumsiness and oversimplification of drawing. I can see here, this is a little simplified. So I don't have samples over here, uh, but this is how it, it does. The left parietal region, that's the inferior parietal lobe, also mediates reading, writing, calculation, performance of reversible operation in space, uh, word finding. More word finding is more temporal lobe, but agnosias, apraxias, uh, limb kind, uh, left right confusion, uh, the Gerstmann syndrome uh, is seen with disruption here. So it's important, along with the cognitive domain, to look at all the focal parietal signs as well. So coming to memory functions, uh, for ages we know that temporal lobe is very important for memory, but the recent literature shows that the whole network, including the frontal, temporal, and the diencephalic structures are recruited for encoding, uh, recall, and recognition. So this is a simple picture to show that the frontal lobe organizes, elaborates information, organizes it in a meaningful way as a strategic aspect. Therefore, a whole lot of executive functioning is involved while we learn a new bit of information. And that information is sent to the rhinal cortex. The rhinal cortex is inside. So the rhinal cortex, the perirhinal and the para, uh, uh, hippocampal regions contribute to information. The parahippocampal regions is part of the dorsal stream. So the context of a situation is computed and sent to the parahippocampal region. And the content that the person has learned is mediated by the perineal cortex. So together, when they enter the internal cortex and hippocampus, the context from the parahippocampal region and the content from the uh, perineal cortex are superimposed in the hippocampus and sent to fornix, mammillary bodies, and thalamus back to the cortical regions. So the hippocampus actually time tags information in terms of autobiographical memory. While the frontal lobe manipulates information into meaningful manner. And uh, as of now, the understanding is that memory is not stored in the temporal lobes, but stored in the uh, respective cortex. Visual memory is stored in the visual cortex. Auditory memory is stored in auditory cortex. And emotional information is stored in amygdala. And uh, they're all tied together in the hippocampus. And one link of the memory can elicit the entire uh, memory per se, including the emotional component. And the whole memory circuitry gets activated. So this is RAVLT, Ray Auditory Verbal Learning Test, uh, typically used for uh, verbal learning in memory. So this consists of 15 words uh, presented at a uh, uh, speed of two seconds per word. And patient is asked to recall the words after it's been presented. And uh, the list is presented again and again and again, and patient is asked to recall. The list is presented five times. This gives us a good understanding of what the ability to learn over trials. There's an interference list, and there's the immediate recall of list A, and there's a delayed recall of list A. Now, if you go back to the previous uh, slide, the temporal lobe, the rhinal cortex apparently holds information for about 20 minutes till it's time tagged, which is why it's important to have a 20 minute delay to be able to comment on the integrity of the temporal lobes in memory function. So when you look at the delayed recalls, most of the delayed recalls are at least 20 minutes. So this is, all of you might know, this is Ashwa Kumari, a logical passage. And uh, we use logical passage also to uh, measure memory, but the logical passage is already logical. Therefore, the role of frontal lobe may be minimized. The patient has to roll, remember the story and recall the story. And there can be a, another story uh, as well. For example, WMS three and four have two passages the first passage, there's an immediate recall and a delayed recall. The second passage is 
passage will have an immediate recall and a delayed uh, uh, two immediate recalls to see the learning curve and there'll be a delayed recall after 20 minutes. This is a very complex figure test and it's really a complex test and uh, requires uh, a lot of uh, executive function to be able to re remember this in terms of organization and uh, uh, the manner in which uh, uh, information is processed. Now the patient is presented with this and asked to copy. So there's a copy component to look at the visual spatial aspect. There is a immediate recall after five minutes. There's a delayed recall after 20 minutes. If, if this picture over here is a copy, then completely it is disrupted or distorted. And then the lesion didn't have to be in the frontal lobes or temporal lobes. It could be in the parietal lobes because the visual perceptual aspect is damaged. If this is a, a, a this is a immediate recall. Probably the disruption is more on in the frontal lobes where working memory could be impaired. And if it's a delayed recall, then the patient can't remember. Therefore, the problem could be more in the temporal lobe. But so like I said, it's not one region mediating one function. It's a bundle of network that mediates all this. This is Benton visual retention test. This is a, a test for immediate recall. Each of the design is presented uh, to the patient for 10 seconds and the patient is asked to draw it immediately. And it, this is forms the immediate memory. So the encoding predominantly mediates the frontal lobe. Uh, recall includes temporal lobe and the circuitry, but many studies show all recall is visual. Therefore, a right frontal lobe is involved because it has to search through thousands of files. If you have to remember uh, who sat next to me in my 10th standard, then I have to sift through a uh, lot of files in my head. The search component, like how we search on Google, is mediated by a frontal lobe. If the search is minimized, the strategic aspect is minimized, then there's more of the uh, temporal, parietal, and occipital uh, uh, activation in MRI studies. So to conclude, most neuropsychological tests are multifactorial. Uh, several areas of the brain work together to produce most of the cognitive functions. Both qualitative and quantitative analysis is required to be able to understand how the brain functions. Neuropsych evaluation is a sensitive method to assess the functional integrity of the brain. Thank you. Sir, I have finished uh, my... Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thanks for very informative and engaging session of Professor Keshav Kumar. Thank you very much. Any question from the audience is welcome. And I over to my colleague, Dr. Naresh, to ask if he can uh, add something more. I think this neuropsychological assessment, I think there's nothing more to add. Dr. Keshav Kumar has presented very, <laughs> yes, yes. And very right. insightful, actually. It's a learning experience as to the various yes. functions of the brain and yeah. uh, the various methods, how the testing occurs. And right. it is mainly for us psychiatrists, how to utilize the information right. with the, or the right. report which they present to us actually. It was very engaging and informative session. That's I have right. ever, it's very interesting. Thank you, sir. Any question from the audience? Participants yes. can ask questions, some question for data ratio. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Kesha, sir, can you uh, stop the slides here so that everyone... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I just forgot <laughs> about it. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. So, uh, sir, thanks for a exhaustive uh, coverage of the concepts. Uh, let me declare here, sir, now that rehabilitation part we will be taking in the next, uh, next Thursday session. So, this was just a build-up. So, uh, Kesha, sir, there are questions coming in the chat box. I have a, since most of the people are here are psychiatrists, so would you right. recommend some simple tests so that uh, without having all those test materials or batteries, simple screens, suppose I just have pen or paper, so what can be established, what can be achieved by just a pen and a paper? What are the tests that can be done? Sir, we need to break it into lobes again. Lobes yes. are, we, we have moved on from robes actually. When I talk about rehabilitation, I'll show, you, I'll show you how the network can be used. So when we look at, of course, lobes are important because uh, they are the uh, primary regions that compute these functions as a, a global uh, network regions. So uh, we need to test frontal lobes. We need to have fluency. 
definitely. Digit span and uh, forward and backward. Forward gives you good amount of attention. Digit span backward will give you working memory. Then uh, uh, you can have uh, maybe uh, for perseveration from stubborn black, those uh, drawings, you have those spikes to look at response inhibition, yeah. uh, those bits, they're very important. But of course, you need to have a long, lengthy, full sheet uh, uh, designs. You have the spike, one spike, two spike, three spike. They're important. Uh, it can give you a good uh, uh, picture about impulsivity. We definitely need to have one passage, a small list of word, words to understand the temporal lobe integrity. Definitely uh, one drawing that is two-dimensional. Please administer the cube as well. All you need is a paper pencil for this. Sorry to interrupt. Just want to ask one question. That is true test. Can you elaborate very simply to these scatists? Sure, sir. Stroop test is a very ancient test. So what we're trying to do is to see the automatic uh, response to a situation is to read. But we are stopping the uh, patient from reading. Instead, ask him to name the color. color, color. So we are, we are, actually, <laughs> so we are yeah. actually creating a conflict. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah right, so, right, right. Right. The conflict is more of our uh, anterior cingulate cortex. So they have to resolve the conflict to be able to stop the reading prepotent experience. So if the patient makes errors, then it is the orbital frontal cortex damage. If the patient takes longer time and not make errors, it may not be orbital frontal cortex at all. It could be more cingulate cortex because it's taking time to resolve it. So Thank you me. want me to explain the test, sir? I can explain. No, it. no, no. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. I thought it's a very common test, so I didn't elaborate. Yeah, I, I know, I know that. <laughs> I just wanted to just explain it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any question from the participants? Uh, I think, sir, uh, Professor Keshav Kumar. Yeah, like, 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 I'll, I'll continue from where Ali has spoken, sir. In right. a, in, in a, in a clinical OPD, we don't have a psychologist. We are in a private practice. Right, so right. two two tests on the frontal lobe, on the temporal lobe, on the occipital lobe, and on the parietal lobe, which right. we should suppose we are suspecting. Even if it's an organic psychosis, maybe epileptic psychosis, we suspect. Yeah. You know, many yeah. times it's a temporal lobe epilepsy, and there is some organicity yeah. involved. Yeah, so yeah. Just two two simple tests, which we should. Anyhow, whenever we think somebody is, you know, having some, might be having some organicity, like Alim was asking, maybe two two simple and which 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 will weed out a lot of you know things out of. So uh, he, wants, he, he wants to ask the temporal lobe, the emotional factors are there and this is psychomotor epilepsy and other things. So to test, how sir. to differentiate the uh, between uh, for the us, tests, For right? us, sir. On the, yes, sir. Hey, for, yes, us. Uh, for us. For us. What are you, you, you are, answers, uh, uh, just uh, one thing. Answer, you are the answer this as well. Right. Oh, okay, okay. okay. You are the laboratory to this catalyst. You are the lab. Right. I think Please. I've answered the question. Yeah, yeah, uh, sure, sure. Maybe you can actually minimize the list that yes. I uh, minimize, minimize that I told uh, right. Dr. Ali. Right. Yes. Probably you can have one fluency, definitely digit span to look at the integrity of frontal lobes. You need to right. have drawings and uh, recall them. Uh, but you must also be careful that when we give drawings to recall, they can be verbally named. So therefore, the load can be verbal also. Uh, left temporal lobe also can uh, do badly on a visual test. So anyway, that's the, that's one of the easiest way to go. So simple drawings to copy and to recall after some time. So you can give a picture, maybe just not a cube, but you can have a slightly complex kind of drawing and you can bring in your other bits of testing like verbal fluency in between. And after the verbal fluency and digit span, you can ask them to recall the drawing and you can actually space it. So after the drawing, you can give a verbal uh, uh, list of five words, 10 words, because this is just a quick screen. There are a number of screens available for cognitive testing. So all this can be used. We've also developed a scale known as, uh, we just did a research on it. So this is an informant based scale. I don't know, uh, many psychiatrists will be working on dementia. IQ code is a very common one. So we just developed a, a informant based uh, scale to identify uh, cognitive deficits, probably it can be used with other people, even psychiatric uh, uh, population where there's a... Are you talking about DCAP? Right? No, sir. DCAP is a app. Uh, that is an app. That's an <laughs> app. 
that's also okay. that's also free, free. that's right. also free and actually it's been uh, that is free that's free that's good. Good. but uh, <laughs> that is for elderly in india and uh, they will ask and we'll give them <laughs> oh right. i think dr keshav is very Kishan famous for you keshav kumar i think you were very modest in answering that uh, there are few tests for the uh, uh, sitting in the op but actually it is injustice to the brain itself and the neural networking to ask for just two tests but what i mean to say is that uh, suppose you I take for example a depressive illness so there are various components in a depressive illness like attention is there uh, concentration is impaired memory is impaired motivation is impaired interest is impaired now when you take a simple like attention there are several components in an attention itself so you are you are looking at different networkings in the brain to elicit attention that right and the same thing for motivation and the same thing for interest as well absolutely so, sir but the question was what can we use yes. in a busy opd but you right. can never you so cannot that's what it is an injustice to you as well so correct. what it means is that we require as much elaborate testing as possible right if, because if you, no 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 sir sir i just depends on this we are trying to what is called as localize doc, the doc, networks in the brain doctor doctor narendra trying to localize the brain there's a purpose sir, for why sir, we are trying to localize uh, the brain there is a question from amrit please listen to sir him. yes sir what what i mean to say is that my question was very simple sir when will we go for all these elaborate test only when we know that there is a degree of suspicion and we find there is some issue so in a clinic you cannot tell that we can look at 100 things that will make us not to go for any test sir what i actually wanted to ask for a busy and here majority are busy practicing psychiatrists who might not be having a clinical psychology like you in hyderabad might be having three psychologists so for me if i am sitting in my chamber without a psychologist and i understand me too me too me too yes <laughs> that is what i was asking and sir has been very very clear he made it made it little less and told us what all we have done thank you sir alim uh, you you any other question i would like to respond i agree with the chairperson and dr Am- amrit uh, in a busy opd you need to have a screener in a to understand the network you need to have elaborate testing which is imperative you just have to have it to have complex interpretation to look at the subtleties you need to have a comprehensive neuropsych but, but a busy opd just to kind of screen and say do they have cognitive deficits to some extent or not i think the smaller ones are good in us because to get an idea about yes. but not complete because the various neuronal function impairments which these tests detect i mean they are very important the in, including for the functional management of the patient as well so the deficits where are there where they can be addressed cognitively or behaviorally or even medications i mean what type of medications are we going to say what is called as uh, algorithmically a lot to that patient depending upon various symptoms or various impairments functional impairments i mean nowadays even symptoms are going off so we are now more or less looking at the functional impairments neural functional impairments phenotypes so endophenotypes what we call it acts right and that you got uh, yeah, you so spoke about the basic yeah. sort of question uh, what are the normal values of this test the normal range of response in digit span fas test so uh, what is the usual range sir it is very difficult to answer this question i tell you why because uh, when we developed the battery that we did one of my is at, excuse me one minute it is as difficult as to manage the covid <laughs> <laughs> right let's uh, lighter mood now you can continue uh, sorry so uh, culturally they are all different so one of my student to develop the elderly battery went to some uh, village in uh, bihar we found that they are not used to digit span backward component as thought process at all they're not exposed to okay so what we got was they did worse than our dementia patients so that was completely false positive so i understand there's a range so western uh, test will say uh, at least 6 to 8 on the digit span forward and 6 uh, uh, to 4 on the digit span backward depending on the person's ability education so there are so many things that come in so better That's to have normative data but we can give you normative data and age also is an important thing sir uh, children have lesser middle age the cognitive functions start declining at the age of 13 so uh, elderly will have lesser so it depends on which group are we looking at let's okay. go there is a question in the chat box uh, sir your input to practice effect in reassessments mainly test shifting wcst but the patient knows the rule of shift 
sir what would be your suggestion for interpretation if the patient can remember please don't give it again for at least 6 months so they say the practice effect will get mellowed down after 6 months so 3 4 months if they remember please do not repeat because you are not testing uh, the effect of a medication or uh, tdcs or uh, whatever medication you are giving if you're looking at the effect of these then practice effect will come into play so you'll get uh, false positive or false negative definitely not wcst sir right. we have to find a right. alternate form uh, uh, sir i asked the question and someone in the chat box has replied uh, in the hindi version of fas uh, it is kama pa kama so, yeah kama yeah. ta pa ma yes yeah. yeah okay Okay, thank you, sir, for the information. And someone has asked about aphasias. What? Uh, How to differentiate between okay. different type of aphasias? See, Broca's aphasia is expressive speech difficulty. So the grammar is gone. The speech becomes very telegraphic. But the uh, the message is delivered. You can understand, but like a telegram. But if it's Broca, it's a Wernicke's aphasia. aphasia patient cannot comprehend what is said may comprehend bits of gestures in between there is conduction aphasia so here the patient can understand and he can also speak but he may not answer to your question if you ask him what is the time you'll say london is a great city okay but he can understand so uh, dictation they'll struggle to write to dictation so can you have a test of broca area versus Wernicke's area, uh, you see. There are many, sir. There are aphasia batteries which actually pick up all this. Western aphasia right. battery. Yeah, there yes, are sir. many aphasia batteries. Yes, sir. Right. I know. Hello. So when, when you take up the arcuate fasciculus, one end is the Wernicke's area and one end is the Broca's area, and there's a continuum. One is the understanding problem, and from there you have the naming area as well, which inputs from the visual right. area, from right. the parietal right. area, from the frontal right. lobe. And finally, the Broca area, which is in the frontal lobe, the inferior frontal lobe. Right. So all right. these inputs are there in the speech area. So the aphasia can be varied actually. So That's whatever true. the inputs in this arcuate fascicle, the final output is the mainly the motor pathway. Broca area from Broca area, the motor pathway. So there right. the dysarthria occurs. So basic thing when you hmm. take this uh, semicircular uh, arcuate fasciculus, so the various types of uh, aphasias. I mean, you depends upon the inputs what the arcuate fasciculus receives. Like. That's true. That's true. Another question from the audience. What is? Uh, sir, is there, yeah, there is a question that uh, what should be the proper chronology? Suppose we start with attention, and then there is any specific chronology of events that is to be followed, or uh, any test can be performed anywhere. And the second part is suppose a person fails on a test or does not get adequate response. So do we come back and retry the test, or we just pass on? it depends on the condition if the patient has uh, liver body dementia fluctuating arousal is the norm there so we need to come back if you think the patient is not understood is is anxious you can always come back in terms of chronology it's useful to give easier test first like you know drawings and bgts that's a conventional wisdom from psychometry that we've been doing as students so you can start with simple test but when we do memory test you cannot in the delayed gaps like i said delayed memory is very important and uh, that is the only thing will tell you about the temporal lobe integrity when you doing delayed test you cannot fill the delay if you're giving a visual test if you're given a cft complex figure test and uh, ask the patient to recall after 20 minutes please do not give visual material in between instead you put verbal material give them uh, other uh, fluency tests or something and the same holds good for uh, uh, verbal test verbal memory test in the space of 20 minutes they can plan your assessment in such a way they can give a complex figure test which is not verbal so so make sure that you don't overlap domains because it will get contaminated so you need to work and it also depends on the time sir so how much of time do you have and how do you want to organize how many tests do you want to use so all these big tests like wcst may not even be required and right. assessment i forgot to tell you assessment starts from the time patient walks into your door 
So all that behavioral observation is very important. If the patient has got akinetic mute, anyway is not going to talk, but the behavioral observation is something like catatonia with no schizophrenia. So they have akinetic mute because they have a lesion in the anterior cingulate cortex. So if the patient doesn't look at you, lack of concern, empty, vacant eyes, then you can still infer that he's got you know, akinetic mute. So the behavioral observation is very important, which is why the process based is. So all of it should be integrated together. Yes. Yeah. Any other so question, the, please? Yeah, yeah. There are some questions regarding you know assessment in children. Children. So, okay. Two or three you questions can ask are from, there. Uh, Dr. Keshav. Yes, sir. What's the question? Sir, sure, one question? Uh, Dr. Hema has asked about simpler form for children with neurodevelopmental issues. And what what are the different uh, for yeah. neurodevelopmental neurodevelopmental issue? What age, what is your question baby, actually? Yeah, question scales, screening tools, is it? Yeah, screening tools. Yeah. So Gessels, okay. Gessels, okay. Vineland social maturity scales. Then uh, Bailey's is a good uh, thing for neurodevelopmental because it starts with months and stuff like that. What was the second question, sir? So one question was, if a child is uh, overactive, not sitting... ADHD. ADHD. So, so how do we conduct the test? ADHD, you want to say? Yes, sir. ADHD, child? You can give child is overactive and not cooperating for long. Okay. Yes. Okay. Scanning test? Overactive and not cooperative. Yeah. Verbal fluency. Not verbal fluency. Yeah. Digit span, short ones. You had to do it over a period of time. When the patient comes back, or the child comes back, you need to do the second one because uh, ADHD itself is going to abort the uh, performance on test. The patient is not going to sit primarily. So if the patient can come back, shorter tests like simple tests where you can hold his attention should be done. Or corner rating scale. Like psychiatrists know about corner rating scale. I don't need to tell about that. Yeah, yeah. And sir, how much variance can the mood state create in these neuropsychological batteries? Huge, sir. Extensively. If the patient is anxious, nothing is captured. Because the patient is so anxious that it really doesn't test the true capacity of the person. Same thing with the depression. If the patient's attention cannot be aroused, cannot be sustained, not motivated, then all these things, apathy, all these things can impact on uh, uh, neuropsychological performance adversely. We have to put the patient at ease and confirm that he is on his optimum uh, functioning capacity. So we need to do in smaller sessions where we can, you know, elicit those responses. And uh, we also another thing that I forgot to mention is fatigue, mental fatigue. So depression will have fatigue. So you need to give adequate breaks. Some of them will cooperate when they're fresh. Uh, early in the morning is a good time to test uh, neuropsych functions for patients when they're fresh, uh, fresh after good sleep and rest. Sir, any special setting of the room or the place where you conduct the test? Quiet room, sir. Quiet room. Definitely can avoid uh, the caregivers in the room because they are going to influence the instruction and the performance also if, if it can be helped. Sometimes we need to interpret with the caregiver only. So, room should be quiet and uh, the table should with, be clean. With, with, with water. Availability. Yeah, that's all there. This is permanent. <laughs> Sometimes patients become very anxious and he require water. And the room, sh um, there should be water in the room. Right? Right, sir. Right, and uh, this is another thing that I want to say. Please yeah. use pencil for drawings. Okay. Okay, do not use uh, pens because we see all our residents using pens. But for one simple reason, if, the, if there's a right parietal lesion, their drawings will be distorted and they cannot appreciate the correct drawing. They can't differentiate a wrong drawing from a correct drawing. But a left Good. parietal patient will perceive and quickly realize that his drawing is wrong. So he'll want to erase it and redo it. That's the okay. very... That's a very important thing to differentiate oh, very left good. and right very because left is always clumsy and oversimplified, but the gestalt is preserved. Okay. But they also good. know that they are done wrong, so they want to okay. erase it. Good, very good. Any any question more? 
there are another question that I think Sir has discussed, but then that is another important question that can be again retold. Is what are the best tests to assess cognitive deficits in illiterate patients, Sir? Yes, cognitive deficit in illiterate patients. That is a very good question. He has asked. So you can do all. No, the it's tests. in the chat box. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we very we right. do a lot of assessment. You can avoid tests like uh, Wisconsin card sorting tests and all, but you can give fluency. They can give uh, a simple, uh, sometimes if, they, if, if the patient is illiterate, you need to establish, establish that he can't hold his pencil. Then no, don't see. give their drawings. Most of the illiterates can sign or write something. If they can draw a picture and you want to look at memory, even if the drawing is clumsy, does, do, does the drawing have facts after a delay? You can still do most of it, sir. So but you can't, do, last... you, you can't do Stroop and all because they have to read. But verbally, yeah, yeah. able to do. And it's yeah. true, you have to read, right? right. Yeah. Right. Any so test one that you are reading, you should avoid. So, so, so one last question, last, sir. Last, excuse me. Sir, I, I, this I, is the sir. last question, only four minutes left. Last question. Sir, la last question, sir. Yes, sir, yes. Uh, two or three things regarding the test. Uh, is it necessary that we must do the test in the morning? How long should the assessment last before you call it a day? And then what should be the gap between two sessions when you do test? Professor Keshav, please reply. So the gap uh, between two sessions can be, you can have one today, one tomorrow, or probably at least two hours if you want to break into sessions. Okay. But uh, what is the typical session length? Because the load is high, we finish one year cycle in one day. So two hours, you can give a small break if they're okay. If they are requesting for break and complaining of headache and fatigue, please stop it after 20, 30 minutes. That and, and is it important to do the test in the morning? Or is there any difference if you do it in the morning or in the evening? There'll be fresher in the morning, but there's no harm in doing it afternoon if the patient is cooperative and uh, can do it. Anytime he's yes. fresh. Yes, sir. Anytime he's willing yes, to do and motivated. Th th thank you very much. It's over to my colleague and the organizing chairman. Please, any comment? And my Dr. Kanareshi, if you want to say something. I mean, from psychiatrist's point of view, like we are looking at, say, the def deficits or the dysfunctional in diseases. And these yeah. dysfunctions are, say, persistent. So it doesn't matter what time or what it is, the, the deficits are there, the functional deficits are there. So anytime we can pick it up or any break also we can pick it up or any test also we can pick it up. So that is more important. Yes. That's all I just want Yeah. yeah. So I'll hand it over to the organizers. Yeah, yeah, organizer. <laughs> Thank you. Sir. Uh, fun, sir. Just a minute before I hand over the fun. Okay. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Kishaf. Yeah. Uh, sir, just a minute. Sir, the yeah, yeah. real to the audience, the real thing is coming in the next session. We are talking about we have actually what we have we, we can do. So so do join us uh, next week. To, for the culmination of this uh, uh, this series of events. So, fun, sir. Okay, thank you. I uh, earnestly thank Dr. Keshav for such an elaborate presentation and trying to simplify the things which are otherwise complex. But my take on is, this is that what the questions raised by Dr. Aleem and Dr. Amrit, those are relevant if you think, look at the picture of psychiatrist deployment in our country. One psychiatrist, even if he's in government hospital, the number of patients he has to see, mathematically considering his fatigue element, one has to think how much time he can really give to the patients for neuropsychological testing. And the next fact is about clinical psychologists. They are not with all the psychiatrists at all the centers, and their exposure to the setup testing is also less. In this background, uh, it, uh, I have idea in mind and time to come, we can have a workshop model in which we can involve Dr. Kesha with limited participation, not in Thursday musing because musing's concept is different, but independently so that we can really empower the interested psychiatrists as well as clinical psychologists to deal with the clinical patients that we face with a limited time. We are not going to increase the time with the number of uh, psychiatrists we are producing and clinical service producing in the next 10 to 15 years. 
but in those 10 to 15 years we continue to understand that any psychiatric disorder can have a does have a neuropsychological component and it has yeah. to be assessed and we are compelled not to ignore it in the practice think of the hospital when i was acting working at the mhi 180 attendants to be completed in 3 hours after that there will be shouting it has to be done no theory no advancement comes to play and in the next session we'll discuss a lot and always my feeling is that we have to make the things which are to be used by us used by the people who are in really giving service to the people so sure. this site of empowerment is required i would like to have a whatsapp model thing if dr kesav agrees and tells what are they we, we can be very very much meticulous and that we can give inputs earlier and we can have dr kesav for the amount of time he requests so that it can give real because one wants to go back yes i have to do this i have these inputs and this gives these ideas and i cannot do this and if it is required i may ask uh, to borrow time and send to another place this has to be very much factual there has to be a shop to deal with the cases without neglecting the suspect which i believe we are doing most of thank you thank you dr thapa thank you naresh thank for you very much interest. thank you very much and i have bored you a lot and rang you many no, times no no <laughs> very pleasant and you, i enjoyed this and for us to be on this uh, platform thank you thank you all thank you dr keshav thank you dr naresh thank you you thank you i will give a thank you dr i will give a formal thank you sir sir and before that formal like formal amrit amrit one minute before that i'll like the response from dr keshav about a whatsapp model on a different Dr. Kesab, are you available, sir? Uh, we can uh, work on that, sir. Yes, thank you. That you will be very much. Everyone who attends it will be highly obliged to you. Sure. Okay. okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you all. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Sir, on behalf of the IPS Odisha State Branch, Dr. Naresh, it is a program of the IPS Odisha Branch, not the East Zone. <laughs> a small correction. <laughs> uh, we would like to thank from our heart, Dr. Kesab, sir. My exceptional presentation it was so tough you know all the neurobiology all the connections all the tests to take make it simple make it it, it was too good and and then we are waiting for the next session that, like dr alim has promised us that the next session will be much more interesting and much more helpful so thank you sir for coming and again uh, we will thank welcome you, we would love to welcome you on our next thursday musings next week thank you dr jagdish sir all the way from <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you very much <laughs> and to hyderabad dr naresh sir dr naresh sir okay. we'll call you one day to speak on this i think you have all the energy <laughs> yeah trapped yeah. inside you and, and you need to take it out some day good 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 thank you to dr tofan sir for chair, being the chairperson of this whole program which which, which i would organize tell that it, organize it, chair, yes, chairman yes it has organize. been hugely successful <laughs> organize, program from one wave to another wave we have been persistent yeah yeah ali yeah. ali we have been discussing about this issue for a long long time thank you for yeah. bringing dr keshav and, and I, i was delighted to see dr sobhni ravi have heard her in a you know post graduate years we have always discussed neuropsychology the automatic words that come to us is dr sobhni rao that, that that was the learning we had in cit yeah, yeah. uh, it was a pleasure to see you uh, thank you ali for that Uh, happy birthday to all. dr rucha one of our organizers who is who has a birthday today thank you dr shazia even though she is oh, not oh it is present. show so happy birthday rucha chalo and thank you for thank the everybody. organizer thank you all thank you ips osb thank you so much good night thank okay, you sir for having have a have, have, nice have, have, have a have a safe weekend have a nice dinner <laughs> thank you sir all the best okay bye bye see good you night, good night thank you bye. good night meet thank you sir. next time thank you so much meet you next time everybody pavan the meeting now अब क्लोज करते हैं
will you close the meeting